I've come to St. James's Church in Piccadilly to begin this, the third of our explorations of the meaning of life. In the first episode, we spoke to scientists and discussed their view that seems to suggest that progress itself gives life a sort of meaning. In the second episode, we dug down into philosophers' view of the meaning of life and discovered, perhaps, that since the 20th century they were really unable to comment. But if there's one group of people who really, really have an angle on life's meaning, it has to be those who possess religious faith. We're in St. James's Piccadilly, and I've chosen this church to introduce our exploration of what people with faith think the meaning of life is, because my friend Sebastian Horsley, the artist, had his funeral here, and Sebastian was a man who really, really wanted life to have a meaning. So much so that in order to create a strange sort of situationist artwork, he once went to the Philippines and had himself crucified. I guess that my worry about liberal humanism is the recurrent feeling this is the default setting for all sensible people. Hmm. D-Day is today. <laughs> my meaning to life is to serve, be good to God and be good to my fellow human beings. Yeah, but I don't think you're really listening to me. I think everything happens for a reason, but I don't know what that reason would be. Does that torment you? No. <laughs> Why not? The range of frequency that we can see through the body compared with what even mainstream science says exists, it's laughable. I think I look to people who have religious faith for some certainty regarding the questions that science and philosophy really aren't able to pin down. And if you want certainty on matters of religion, who better to go to than someone who has been the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams? What I've been discovering is how inadequate most people's answers to the question are. Mm. I think if there's a sort of discontent about the functionalizing of human beings, you know, that all, all we do is just slot into preordained patterns, cogs in various kinds of machinery, that doesn't add up to very much. There's got to be something more about what you imagine human beings to be like, and that's one of the resources I think religious commitment has to offer. It seems that very much at the core of your thinking, both your belief and your practice, lies the idea that in a sense, if we're to discover and adhere to meaning in life, then we have to be very, very conscious of life's mystery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think really from well, from school days on, there's been that sense that um, the worst thing that can happen for human beings is to suppose that they've they've tied up what the possibilities are, they've explored what they're really like, they've they've plummeted the depths of themselves, and whether it was doing King Lear at A-level or reading Greek Orthodox theology as a graduate student, it seemed to be the same thing that was running through, that there, there were things that couldn't be captured, there were aspects of ourselves and one another that, you know, related to something quite out of our horizon, and that, that became a very central part of what I thought faith was about. So that happened early to you? I think it really was actually studying English at school that did it. <laughs> Again, following things of yours that I've read, you, you have a kind of critique of what you describe as bad religion. In a, in a sense, it's that old sawhorse. You're, you're being spiritual when you talk to God, but when God talks directly to you, you should get a little bit worried about things. <laughs> and, and the idea of, of this terrible religion is a religion that's, that's a totalizing explanation. Exactly, yes. Yes, where both God and yourself are absolutely transparent. Mm. There's, n there's no work to do, no frustration, no sense of difficulty. And for me, if nothing's really difficult, there's nothing that gives us the abrasion to grow, to, to challenge, to say, it doesn't have to be like this. So 
the very fact of mystery itself should in some way impel us towards the religious cast of mind. And I, I wonder if the problem that we in the secular world have with the way in which religion characterizes mystery is that we keep expecting it to be a bit like a film in which we just watch it and accept what's going on and never think about the paunchy middle-aged man wearing a sleeveless anorak who's actually holding the microphone boom just out of shot. Trouble is, this yapping and yawning. I'm going to wait till this radio stops squawking. It's not really what you expect in the house of God, somebody kind of clanking around. We're making a program for Radio 4 All right. on the meaning of life. Oh. Do you well, have any views? I think everything happens for a reason, but I don't know what that reason would be. Does that so. torment you, that you don't know the reason for things? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. I'm a very positive person. I just, I'm really happy with what I have, and I don't think I need to complicate it more than, more than that. <laughs> I wish I was you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Why would an omnipotent super-being create a lot of little sub-beings and then put them through a kind of real-time moral experiment? You're asking like, the wrong person. Well, I am not that super-being, so I can't answer on behalf of him. Ajmal Mazroor is an imam, broadcaster and politician. I mean, for example, if I were running a sort of bunny rabbit farm and I devised a way of, of deciding whether bunny rabbits were being moral and believing in me as their kind of immediate rabbit god. And then when they all reached the end of the na their natural life, I could kill them or subject them to more pain or whatever. Would you not regard that as a little bit perverse on my part? But you as a creator of bunny rabbit would have an absolute authority over your bunny rabbits. Right. Bunny rabbits would not have the I right... I breed to... the bunny rabbit. But you know what? Your bunny rabbits won't even have the capacity to think about you. No, I see. So because you... if they start thinking like you, they become you. Right. And if they become you, you cease to be the creator. God is the creator. I can't be like God. I can't think like God. Okay. He's above and beyond me. However, he has given me a defined life and a purpose. As long as I lead my life in a decent moral way, mm. within that framework of purpose, I'm okay. It seems to me like <laughs> your experience of life is a bit like somebody reading a book would be the analogy. As long as you suspend disbelief in, for example, Anna Karenina, the famous novel by Tolstoy, then it really matters to you whether Anna is an adulteress or not. But if you just look at it as a series of black marks on a white page, then you're not going to engage with it. Yeah? You can try and travel with your mind as far as you want. Mm. How do you know your mind is not deluding you? You're not becoming delusional in order to make meanings to a life that you are incapable of me making meanings. Mm. How are you sure, so sure that your mind will fathom mm. what awaits you beyond your life? Mm. This in itself is in a, as a separate discussion and a conversation, mm. I believe. I have to accept that I'm a human being. My capacity until a certain point I have to recognize and beyond it, it's impossible. Mm. And within this capacity, I have a meaning to life. Mm. My mean to, meaning to life is to serve fellow human beings, be good to God and be good to my fellow human yeah, beings. But I don't think you're really listening to me. That all obtains as long as you suspend disbelief in the existence of God. But if you don't, then none of it obtains. I agree, but why do you have to suspend? In many ways, the kind of position I take in, in relation to these questions would strike most people as, as very pessimistic and quite negative, but I don't really experience it that way myself. I, I experience it as a bit of a liberation, actually. The things I wanted to know the answers to when I was young, I think I was just, like, straightforwardly wrong about. I mean, I think, you know, like many people, I was a victim of, of, uh, of an ideology so complete that it's very very difficult to think outside of it and the decline of religious faith has, has left us with a lot of kind of expectations about things being explained to us and explicable because they did seem to be explicable within the framework of traditional Judeo-Christian theology. 
that people start to wonder whether life has any meaning or not, it's a question that's raised against the backdrop of the retreat of religion. <laughs> it's sort of, oh, maybe God doesn't exist, then, then what does it all mean? The need for a meaning in our lives, it's actually a sign of human frailty. Uh, so it's, it's really a kind of reactive question rather than a real question, but it's kind of a bit of a hangover, the whole kind of meaning of life problem. The Christian religion was extremely useful. I'm assuming you lost your faith in the actual sky god. I can remember it distinctly because I was that age when you start questioning stuff. You basically sound like you're offering me some psychotherapy, and I've had plenty of that already, and I'm still <laughs> very, very unhappy. Do we have no purpose? Are we not here you for have a great talent for unhappiness. Mm. Well, I mean, that's not making me any happier either, John. The starting point, then, for me to find meaning in my life as a Christian is to profess my faith. It's not to launch an intellectual inquiry into the foundations of religion, is it? I think that's right. There's a basic moment when you say, OK, I will trust this to deliver mm. something. And to say, I trust this to deliver something, is to say, I'm going to give it time. There will be intellectual questions to deal with. There will be things to mop up along the way. There will be mm. things that, yeah, that have to be honestly faced there. But nobody much, I think, comes into that act of trust just by a kind of killer argument. Mm. There is no killer, there is argument. No killer there argument. There can be Otherwise, no. You also, uh, I think, with some subtlety in, in some of the stuff that, that, that I've read, are, are fairly critical of liberal humanism as, as being another way of obviously making man the measure of all things and then... It's funny, isn't it, this, this word humanism, which has such a, you know, a very, very deep and often very religious connotation, historically speaking. But I guess that my worry about what is called and calls itself liberal humanism is the, the kind of pervasive feeling or the recurrent feeling this is the default setting for all sensible people. Mm. All we need to do is get sensible people together and they'll make sensible decisions. Mm. And... You know, decades in universities and churches um, have not really reinforced my optimism about that. So it, it rather depends upon uh, what it calls for to... Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a dial Ellis, it's a circular bit of reasoning. I, I think it is. I think that's, that's my, my scepticism. Mm. So Rowan Williams and I agree there is a sort of circularity about liberal humanism. It marches on into the future, arguing that because we're getting better in every way, we must get better in every way. And I think a lot of people who cleave to that kind of liberal humanist thinking are nonetheless aware of a kind of gulf of meaninglessness opening up under their feet as they march onward like good liberal humanist soldiers. So, I can't march with them. But on the other hand, I'm finding it extremely hard to suspend disbelief in Rowan's point of view. Is that because the traditional aspect of Christianity and the other Abrahamic religions doesn't fit well with me? Perhaps a more heterodox thinker will appeal to me and give me a way that I can hang on to this idea of faith and allow it to give my life meaning. When it comes to heterodox thinkers, you don't really get more hetero than David Icke. And this multi-level conspiracy, as we're going to get into as the day unfolds, has been set up to disconnect us from who we are and put us in a false sense of self-identity, hypnotizing us to believe a lie about our very self. Who is behind it? The body uh, and the brain can only decode a certain range of frequencies. I mean, if you, if you look at mainstream science and you see the um, range of frequency uh, uh, that we can see 
and perceive through the body compared with what even mainstream science says exists in, the, in this universe. It's laughable. So the body is a vehicle to interact with that frequency range. Mm. Thus, when we are experiencing through it, our perceptions are all happening within that frequency range. And we, we look at the world and we think we're looking at everything in the space that we're looking at. We're looking at a ludicrous tiny fraction of it. And what happens in human society when you go through this process, through influenced by parents, influenced by education, influenced by media, influenced by peer pressure, influenced by scientists and doctors and journalists who've all been through that same process, there is this kind of spoken and unspoken consensus that reality is as reality is uh, supposed to be according to all the influences that you've had uh, mostly through your life. And so people think in terms of limitation because that's what they're experiencing. Self-identity with their name, their body, their life story, their race, their religion. And the more people get focused on that tiny little area of possibility, the more the peripheral vision disappears mm. and you become isolated in terms of influence from your greater awareness. The idea is to enclose us in this frequency range and then manipulate us to become slaves to their agenda. So if faith isn't about suspending disbelief, but a more sort of subtle apprehension of things that we can't, in the ordinary course of things, perceive, then how do we sort of get to it? Ajmal says that mindfulness has a place here. This mindfulness in Islam is known as taqwa, mm also translated as God consciousness. I yes. don't like the word God consciousness because it doesn't really give the Arabic word its fair treatment. I think it's better translated with the new buzzword mindfulness. Yeah. It enables me to really connect with my inner being. There is a verse in the Quran I will try and quote. God is like the light of the heavens and the earth. The example of this light is like a niche made out of glass. Inside that glass is a radiant light, brilliant like a shining star. This light has been lit, though no fire has ever touched it. It's not of the east nor of the west. This is an, an analogy of our heart, inside which the brilliant light is the breath of God. And if we keep our heart clean, the light of God comes out and illuminates us and everybody around. And if we allow it to be obscured by all the intoxicating effects of our society, all the material influences, the influence of God, the power of the light of God, doesn't illuminate you and me. If in order to have faith we need to connect directly to our divine nature, then it seems pretty obvious the things we do in the modern world might be getting in the way of that. They're trying to sell it as superhuman when actually it's about making a subhuman. So do you th think that transhuman and stuff, you know, Ray Kurzweil, who's now at Google, is very big on it, is, is also part of that agenda? He's talking openly about humans thinking from the cloud, as he called it. That's the, what I've been calling over the years the technological subreality by 2030. Mm. And the more um, the time goes on, the less the human mind will be involved and more the cloud will be doing the thinking. I mean, we talk about the meaning of life and mm. the nature of who we are. Well, it will be very easy to answer that question once the transhumanist agenda is in place because we will be an accessory to technology. Mm. And more than that, will be an accessory to whoever or whatever controls that technology. You also believe that there are entities abroad in the world that are decidedly malevolent. And right. You must encounter them, or do you not? Well, it's not about encountering the entities. It's encountering the, encountering the actions of the entities, if you like. But have you ever encountered the entities themselves? We are interacting with... Uh, a force which is manipulating human society mm. and seeking to further and further dilute um, human perception to the point where we become easier and easier to control. 
which is what this transhumanist agenda is, is all about, I would suggest. Um, but we are um, interacting with them um, in, in, within this reality, the ones in the shadows that run the secret societies and the, and the exclusive secret societies that run the satanic groups that interact with them. So that, um, And therefore, we are experiencing the result of that all the time. We're, we're experiencing it um, in the sense of constant, incessant wars, constant, incessant um, uh, deprivation for more and more people, while uh, the tiny less than 1% are accruing more and more of the world's wealth and resources. Um, this, I would strongly suggest, is not a random process. It's been designed that way. Very tired, but if you got, and understandably so, since you are fully gravid, as we say. Due date is today. Mazel tov. <laughs> what could be more suitable than to talk to you for a, a series of programmes we're doing on the meaning of life? Oh, goodness Since you me. are about to produce new <laughs> yes. life. Don't make me laugh too much okay. in case it comes yeah, right absolutely. now, which would be a bit weird. Do you think women who, who can perform this incredible feat of parturition have more meaningful lives than men? Oh God, um, that, I think no. I think that'd be a bit harsh. I think a lot of men wish they could. So it'd be a bit unfair to be like, oh, you know, you don't get to mm. experience the meaning of life. When I've talked to all the mothers of my children about this, yeah, now, what have they said? They said that 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 all of that sort of worry that you have about the world and why we're here and where it's all going sort of recedes. I that suppose you do get quite focused on, yeah, on yourself rather than mm. less about what's going on around you. You know, we're really happy and all of that. But I don't think it's like, you know, this is going to give me all this extra mm. meaning. Mm. But I don't know. I mean, I might have it and then be like, oh, my God, this is the <laughs> meaning of life. What strikes me... It's, there seems a kind of odd similarity between the thinking of David Icke and the thinking of people like Rowan Williams and Ajmal Masroor. They all seem to think that it's possible for our very, very human and particular psyches to merge with this sort of universal consciousness. And perhaps there are deeper similarities and affinities between people like David Icke and Rowan Williams and the kind of people who sing and dance in the street because they're so very happy. You guys, you belong to a group called Hare Krishna. In keeping with people uh, who adhere to Eastern traditions, you tend to view the phenomenal world as, in a sense, illusory. According to our scriptures, the world is illusory, but only in terms of the fact that it's temporary. So, for example, we're a soul inside of a material body. So the body has a beginning and it has an end. Whereas the soul, the soul is eternal, it's real, that's actually you. And moving from body to body that's like changing your clothes when a set of clothes gets old you throw them away get a new set of clothes so i think i am white i am black i'm indian i'm american i'm male i'm female i'm cat dog tree bird bee whatever but this is just a temporary designation which we've identified with actually we're all intimately related I would describe what people call God as infinite awareness, mm. having infinite experiences to infinitely experience itself. If God is God, not just another item in the universe, then God's never just sitting in a chair opposite me as you, as you are. Mm. Therefore, the relation that, broadly speaking, the contemplative wants to talk about is a relationship which is and isn't a relationship to what's other. The knowledge of the soul is only with God. Yeah. However, God still wants us to recognize this overpowering light of God, the breath of God resides in all of us. Mm. And to be able to understand that, to be able to connect with it, is to connect with my existence. The breath of God lies in our soul, right inside us. And we deny 
then we have denied ourselves. And that's one of the meanings I put to life. Yeah, it's, it's baffling, disorientating, out of your control, what you're in touch with. It's also not something out there mm. um, with, with a border. And trying to get that balance between the utter difference of God and the utter intimacy is, is the task that I suppose mystical writers have struggled with and, and magnificently failed with <laughs> over the centuries. We're making a programme for BBC Radio 4 right. on the meaning of life. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> Do you have any views? Um, I don't think there is any meaning to life. Um, I think it's just a bit of a happy accident, really. None at all? No uh, meaning? No. I... And there's a sort of futility, perhaps, in searching out that meaning? Um, I think it's, it's probably we tell ourselves stories so that... You know, we don't get so scared, you know, a bit like fairy tales and Santa Claus. But And that's I, sort of religion, isn't it? It it's is. It's a kind of fairy tale. And science, in a way. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I think we're searching for something that theoretically might not actually be there. But, but you yeah, know, I, I think you just have to come to terms with it. You know, life is a cycle. You know what's going to happen in the end and just make the most of it. Yeah, along the way. And what's your attitude to, towards people who feel they have a great meaning in their lives? And they... I feel a bit sorry for them because I think when you finally find out that there isn't, you know, you've spent your whole life searching for something that just isn't there. If you were to accept that it wasn't there now, then maybe you could have, I don't know, a slightly more fulfilled life. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. You're welcome. Needless to say, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Self's Search for Meaning was presented by Will Self and produced by Kerry McCarthy. And you can listen to all three episodes in the series on the BBC iPlayer.